Hey there! I'm so excited to be with you guys, my favorite people um, from White Oak, Texas. That's awesome. Uh, I'm thrilled that you have been kind enough to give us some of your time so that we can uh, talk a little bit about the interesting things that your district is doing. And I thought what we would do is start out with uh, letting people know who you are, um, what you do, what your role is, and maybe how your role supports connected learning within the district. And I'd also like, as you, as you tell us a little bit about who you are, maybe do it through a connected learner lens where you can tell us, um, you know, do you see your own self as a connected learner as we get ready to go into this conversation. So we're going to start with you, Mr. Gilbert. Tell us a little bit about who you are. My name is Mike Gilbert. I'm superintendent of schools at White Oak ISD. I'm uh, currently in my seventh year in this position. Um, 33 years as a public school educator in the state of Texas. As far as my journey as a um, connected learner, I've come a very long ways from a person that was uh, not very interested in the technology end of things to a person that understands that what we're doing now and preparing our kids for the 21st century is the most vital oper operation that we'll have to school. Um, my part in that, or I guess my uh, job in that process, is basically to open doors and facilitate the needs of Ms. Neely and Scott Floyd. Uh, Michael Grass and others at White Oak ISD and just give them a platform where they can do what they need to do for our kids. Um, I guess my job is to clear obstacles, I guess would be the way I'd look at it. All right, wonderful. So nice to meet you. All right, I'm Mitzi Neely, Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum, Instruction and Assessment at White Oak ISD. My third year here in the district and my 33rd year in education as well. And it's just uh, an incredible experience to be a part of this process in our school district. I had a good bit of experience with technology, but to say it matched in any way, shape, or form what we have here as a district, it's just, it will blow you away with what the opportunities are here for our kids and the availability of what we have and where we're headed. I'm just very blessed to work in a very forward thinking, uh, district who values that 21st century education and today's learner. So it's just a combination of technology curriculum. Mr. Gilbert gives us a lot of autonomy to, to move forward with where we're headed. All right. I am Scott Floyd. I am the entire instructional technology department here in White Oak ISD. Uh, this is my 17th year in education, all of which have been here in White Oak. And my job is to support and enhance any programs put in place, integrating technology into our curriculum and our learning processes by our staff and or students. And I have the opportunity to work with in classrooms with kids on a regular basis. And then I work with staff either individually or in larger groups and sometimes in a virtual environment. So I'm very fortunate in that manner that I have all those opportunities. Now, Scott, um, you and I have known each other from being connected in online spaces. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself and how you see yourself as a connected learner? Sure. Uh, I actually started blogging um, with the National Writing Project back in 2005, 2006. And then I, I moved away from that group blog into my own individual blogging uh, toward the end of that. I started on Twitter in 2007 when they started. And I've been connecting with thousands of very intelligent education folks all around the world, um, along as well as people from other industries that benefited our staff and our students. So anytime those opportunities come up for our kids or our, our classrooms to collaborate outside, um, I'm able to use those connections to bring folks in so they can learn a, a different point of view. So I've been able to have that ongoing learning process. It, it truly makes me into a lifelong learner. 24-7 whenever I open up any of those connections. Do you think that's helped to influence uh, the role and what, what's happened there in the district? Those I'll let Mr. Gilbert in. Yeah, I understand the question. I'll let Mr. Gilbert answer that one. Okay. Oh, I don't think there's any doubt that that's influenced a lot of the things that we do here because um, I actually pulled Scott out of the classroom uh, to put him in the position of instructional technology director for the purpose of you know, changing instruction. Uh, really, back seven years ago, we weren't using the word transformation. We weren't using the terminology of, you know, transform the the process of learning. But really, if you look back at it, that's what we were doing. And and we put Scott in this position as in instructional technology. And the and really the the way I explained his entire, uh, oh, 
his his whole uh, job description was whatever you want to do and you don't have time to do or you can't figure out how to do it in technology Scott can and quite frankly in the you know six seven years however long it's been that he's been doing this he hasn't let us down yet um, you know I'm a I'm a stalker on Twitter you know I don't I don't tweet very much but I read a whole lot of them uh, I have a blog uh, my blog is basically a, a a, a political site where I address a lot of the things that are taking place that affect White Oak ISD and affect our students and I think it's very informative for about the seven or eight people that read it and uh, you know I I um, so just he, he again and then just the things that I do to communicate with email text messaging all those kind of things are um, a lot of that can be credited to what I've seen in Scott so do you think it's important for a superintendent to be a connected learner um, only if he wants his, his district to be a connected learning district and only if he wants his teachers to feel comfortable about the fact that they can try things and not do well and back up and start again. Um, if, if a superintendent or if someone like myself wants to foster an atmosphere where people are not afraid of failure, then they've got to show them, you know, that superintendent, me, I've shown that I have a, a, a very strong ability to fail myself. All right. Thank you for that. I think that's a very um, brave statement for superintendents to understand that it's through that failure that we really do learn the most. So, um, Ms. Neely, I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about your district and, and uh, help me understand a little bit about the setting that you're in and the, like the number of kids you have. Uh, in Texas, we're considered a Class 2A district. We have about uh, you know 1,420 kids thereabout. Uh, 100 teaching staff, but a total of about 175 staff across the district, and including all job descriptions. Um, we serve four campuses, a high school, a middle school, an intermediate, and a primary school. And I serve four principals, the 100 te teachers that are on the teaching staff, and curriculum and technology work very seamlessly together uh, for the instruction side and the technology side to get our teachers what they need. Scott and I visit a lot of classrooms. We work with a lot of teachers one-on-one, -on -one, model for them, work with kids, whatever they need. And that's what we really stress here. Awesome. So I know that your district has been leading in the connected learning space for quite some time now. I was wondering um, if any of you would tell me a little bit about some of the journey and some of the interesting things that you're doing around um, connected learning and seamless uh, global interaction. Okay. All right, Scott, you want to kick that off? Sure. Uh, we actually were recognized by our Texas Education Agency as one of the top in instructional technology schools or school districts in the state. So we are what they call a Power on Texas school. And they brought in a camera crew for three days and videoed the work that our staff and our students were doing, uh, followed them around. It, it really was neat to watch that process because it really didn't bother the kids that they were on camera. They just kept doing what they were doing. So they they were so used to producing content at that point that it didn't make a difference to them that other people were watching them produce that content. And we were able to really, we were very fortunate in that our, our youngest campuses, our primary and our intermediate campus, they, they bought in early into the process. So those kids were immersed in produce, being public with their learning. And that really helped in the secondary campuses as they moved up. Uh, those teachers in the middle school and the high school, they saw that those kids were coming in and the parents had that expectation that our kids were learning out loud. They were being public with, with what was happening and it allowed the transparency in our district. So our parents recognized what was going on and they saw the value in it because if one teacher was blogging publicly with their kids and another teacher wasn't, then the principal generally got a call and said, you know, hey, I know what's happening in this teacher's class. Why don't I know what's happening in that one? So the peer pressure came from the outside, and that helped grow those things. Now, our kids use, uh, we've used Skype in our classrooms to bring in, uh, matter of fact, in the spring we had a gentleman that was a Holocaust survivor Skyped in from Israel and spent about an hour with our students and shared some, just some, a beautiful witness of what he went through. Um, he, he did such a great job, and it was, it was neat to watch because all the adults in the room they didn't walk out with a, you know, without a tear in their eye. And the kids, it didn't affect them as strongly, but you could tell they realized the, the seriousness of it. And they didn't get that out of the story they read as much. So they, we were able to use a tool, a free tool like that to bring them in. 
um, we, we have we have that occur regularly. Uh, we use Twitter. We're going to we have a school chat, a Twitter chat where we're going to do a book study during Connected Educator Month, and we're going to have a, the author of the book is going to join us, and we'll have that weekly chat over the month and get through that. Some of our staff we offered books to everybody, and a, a large number of them said, "Well, I don't need the paperback. I already downloaded it on Kindle or on my iPhone." Or so they they step out there and they take their they're learning into the digital realm as well. They don't have to stay tied to a textbook or to a paper book. Um, they, we have kids that we have wireless throughout our entire district, so they can be in our nature center and they can stay connected. Um, we we have them go out and do studies uh, where the some of the group stays in the class, and then the other group is out there with a scope on a rope and a computer, and they're skyping back into the classroom saying, you know, here are pictures or a video of the samples we're collecting. And then the kids in the classroom are the scientists and the researchers that are looking it up, trying to perfectly identify what it is, which has its own funny stories to go along with it as well. When you know they misidentify the leaf and it's poison ivy, and they thought it was an oak or something, you know that kind of stuff. But but they learn from that, you know, and and it's it's funny to watch them take charge of their learning because they just have access to those tools, and the teachers feel free enough to allow that. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much. So I'm curious. You're telling me a lot of things that are happening with the kids that are they're using the technology in real and authentic ways they're connecting with other people they're connecting um, with each other I'm curious how did the teachers because you gotta kinda own it to give it away how did the teachers get to that place one of you want to tell me some of the uh, professional learning kinds of things you're doing where you're taking this informal social learning that's going on and making it um, business as usual part of your regular daily business and the way that teachers learn one of the things that we did that we are very proud of is a year ago we implemented uh, professional learning collaboratives and those are half day conversations with teachers that cross grade levels and content areas and what's the very cool part of that is that it's our teachers teaching our teaching staff wow. best practices with regard to technology integration curriculum development uh, best practices with you know regard to a number of things just where we'll become student-centered classrooms and not so much teacher-centered classrooms and then not to be afraid to step out there with regard to technology the types of devices that they they want to use or the uh, social media pieces they want and so we're we're really very blessed to have all that in place and that was the segue point of moving then to professional learning communities which we've started in, and now we're in that journey this school year. That's wonderful. So has technology informed the learning community work that you're doing at all? I mean, I know connect um, it's teachers connecting with each other and having powerful conversations is amazing in and of itself, but are they using the technologies to uh, go out, connect with other people, and then bring what they learn back to inform what they're doing, or is there any way that, um, that I guess what I'm looking at is, is there any way that connected learning is a part of that? Sure. Well, I think it is. I, you know, I, and and it kind of goes way back, um, goes back to the beginning, really, when we started this process of how were we were how were we going to get technology um, to grow in the district? How were we going to get teachers to buy in? Uh, because really, a lot of the things that you've heard to this point, you know, you can assign four days to the school year. You can have people come in to teach, but there has to be a a buy in from the teachers to get that process started. And ours came seven years ago with just introducing technology to a very small number of teachers that were very interested in using that technology and enhancing their classrooms. From there, you know, being a connected learner, I think, kind of uh, connects to this from a standpoint of they first connected with each other. Our teachers have been teaching each other how to integrate technology in the classroom for seven years. Then in that process, going to the professional learning collaborative where they, we turned it into a little bit more of a formal model, and then including the ideas that we're going to become a professional learning, we are a professional learning community school district. They know they can reach out to each other, but they also know they can reach outside of this school district to other experts and, and, and bring that information to their students and bring that information to their fellow teachers to enhance school. I think there's a piece to that story about the Holocaust survivor speaking to our school that really connects this this part of it. Uh, that whole process of actually having our kids 
hear firsthand from a Holocaust survivor what it was like to be um, in a concentration camp started with a tweet, with one tweet. Uh, Scott Floyd's got um, a, a vast number of followers. He simply put out a tweet that said, got some kids working on a project with Holocaust survivors. Anybody got any connections that can help me out? From that, you know, it grew into a place where all of a sudden we're talking to people in the Department of Education in Israel, oh, wow. and people in the Department of Education in Israel are putting us in contact with this gentleman that uh, visited with our kids. So, now, if that were the only time that ever happened in White Oak, that wouldn't be an idea of connected learning, but that's just an example of a lot of things that are taking place in White Oak and are taking place with a lot of our teachers. Uh, I think they really, we're starting to really grasp the idea that professional learning communities reaching outside of our school district and our textbooks and our resources is a way to truly transform the classrooms and truly make this a model where our kids enjoy the learning process and get a learning process that's 21st century, 21st century um, focused. Thank you for that. Very, very powerful stuff. And you're right. I can, ima I can only imagine the learning that took place um, even just in the conversations with another Department of Education in a country very different than your own. So I know a little bit about White Oak in that I know that um, I've read things and heard things that you were doing that were pretty progressive and ahead of your time, such as BYOD before it was cool and unfiltered access and things of that nature. I wonder if somebody could talk to that a little bit. If a did that have an impact in you being um, a connected learning district? And if so, how do other districts get started in that? What are, what are your recommendations? Um, I think I can answer to the, a little bit about the, um, the, I guess for lack of a better term, what, what some people describe as risk taking in regards to our network and the open access that we give to our teachers. Um, it's very difficult to get a teacher to buy into the idea that we want them to be 21st century teachers and we want our teacher and our students to be 21st century learners and we don't allow them to access any 21st century tools web 2.0 tools those things that are taking place in other classrooms so early on in this process the decision was made that our that our entire network would be open when you come to White Oak ISD and you want to get on the network you turn your computer on you don't have to have a, a, a password to get on. And as presenters like yourself and others have come into the district, that's been something. Others come in, they kind of, it seems to be special to them. And so, you know, I guess we take a little bit of pride in that. Uh, it just goes to the idea of how much are you going to trust the people that you have in the classroom with your students, you know. We are we're not going to tighten the screws down on on uh, on filters. We're not going to uh, be the people that decide whether or not they use content. We're going to let professional educators in a professional education setting of the classroom make those decisions about what's best for the kids. And we're going to be comfortable in the process of, of supporting them in that role. I wonder, and then I know some of the others will probably want to weigh in, but I wonder if you could tell me, do you think trust um, treating students, I mean, t treating teachers like professionals. We hear so much about student agency, but I'm hearing teacher agency. Do you think that had a lot to do with the um, the ability for your district to move to where it is now in this culture shift? Well, I'll let both of them speak to this too, but I can tell you this. There's no way we would have made it to the place that we are and had the amount of participation that we had, that we do have, if our teachers had to work 10 times as hard just to get a piece of technology into the classroom or just to get that piece of technology turned on and use the tool that they wanted to use. At some point in time, you become exhausted with the battle and you don't try anymore. And that doesn't take place in White Oak. And I'll turn it over to the people that know what they're talking about. That's great. That's wonderful. Who'd like to go next and tell me a little bit, maybe a little bit about the BYOD work that you're doing? You want to do that? Sure. Sure, I'll talk to that. Uh, we actually... We're very fortunate. Uh, you know, a lot of tech departments, they have this strong fear that um, if they start allowing the options for BYOD or if they start loosening up their filter, which we are SIPA compliant for the record, uh, they feel like that's going to cause them uh, a new level of risk or a lot more work. 
And our chief of technology, Michael Grass, has a completely different view of that. It's a lot more work for him to tell people, no, you can't do this, no, you can't do that, no, you can't do that. Uh, from my point of view, I am the only one that handles instructional technology from, you know, from that standpoint, but I can't tell you all the tools that every one of our teachers use. If they want to try something new and they don't have time to learn it, I go learn it, and then I teach them and generally teach their students at the same time. Now, if I never use that tool again, I'm no longer the pro at it, that teacher and those students are, and they share it with the people down their hallway, so now they become the specialist, and that's where we're able to utilize our staff to do so much support for each other, and that, that's really built our PLC process up. Um, being a BYOD district allows both our staff and our students to feel the freedom and flexibility to learn with the tool that they're most comfortable with. Um, I have a child who happens to love his iPad, but he also loves his Chromebook, and he carries his cell phone with him, and he decides what device it is that he uses in class. That's the only thing that had a notebook is all he carries around in his drawstring bag all day. And there were the times, you know, where that you'd walk into class and the review would be on the board and the teacher would say, okay, here's the test review, make sure you get, the, get it written down. And he walks up there with his iPad, snaps a picture and sits back down and says, okay, what's next? So it's made him more efficient as a learner. It's made our teachers more efficient as instructors and facilitators of that learning. And we supplement through BYOD so we don't have the equity issues. Um, because we let them use whatever, our students have options as to what device they may want to use of ours and we provide them with Google accounts so they can upload their documents or whatever it is that they want so they can access it from wherever, whenever. We don't put those limits on them. Um, you end up spending a whole lot of time trying to be their filter when what, what you really could do is transform your classroom or transform your teaching practices and they get so engaged those problems tend to not be there. So, so, do, you, so do you think the non -fil the having it filter free and having BYOD has has also helped with the connections outside the building? Has that made is that the reason that's so alive? Oh, absolutely! And I can give you several stories. Uh, we have a high school Spanish teacher. Uh, her students create they have tw if they don't have a Twitter account, they create one for her class. And if the parent has a concern, they keep it private. But those kids utilize those accounts all through the year to interact with each other to to create a learning support group of their own. And then um, she's turned around and utilized that to connect with Spanish teachers throughout the world. And now her club this year, she's got it in line where her kids are gonna interact with kids from South America. And then they're going to respond in the language they're trying to learn. So they'll be getting English from Spanish speaking countries and they'll be replying in Spanish from our classes. Uh, we have second grade teacher. She got on Twitter and we connected her with some other elementary teachers and she liked it so much that she was learning. She made a comment to one of them, wouldn't it be great if our kids could learn like this? So they both created second grade classroom Twitter accounts that they only allow, they keep private, and they only allow other second grade classrooms to follow and that's all they follow back. It's not the teacher's account, it's the classroom's account. And during the day when the kid has that aha moment, they have permission to go over, type in what they've learned so they're getting 21st century skill practice plus literacy practice here and they type in what they learned and they hit the button and they tweet out to all the other second grade classrooms and then they learn from those others as well so it may not be the same topic that they're learning locally so yeah they're seeing the power of the tools to connect and learn from other people That's great so and a lot of districts block those social communication tools or social learning networks and we don't and Cheryl one other thing too I, I think it's important here with what Scott and Mr. Gilbert have said is we just have a variety of devices that we bring to the district. They're in instructional materials allotment. And so those might be netbooks or Samsung Chromebooks, or they might be iPods or iPad 2s or MacBooks or whatever it is. But if the teacher has a clear need for something, all we ask is you just let us know what you need, the justification or the, you know, the, the part behind whatever it is you're going to do with it. And there's, Scott and I like to say there's rarely a day, and I don't know in three years if we've had that day really where we've had to say no, we can't do that. We our job is we're the solution people. Oh, we figure great. out how to get it. We're not going to stop that. So I know we're getting to the, close to winding up here, but I'm curious. Certainly, parents had to push back on you. Certainly, there had to be other obstacles. Can you think of a couple lessons learned you'd share around how to get parent buy-in or how to overcome some of the obstacles that you were presented? 
Uh, I think I can speak a little bit to uh, some obstacles with parents. And to be real honest with you, um, the other thing that we've worked on a great deal in White Oak along with uh, transformation of the classroom and introduction of, of technology into the education process is we've been very um, focused on transparency in the district. Uh, from the very beginning, we've tried to make uh, everything that we do as accessible and as um, open as we can to parents. So there are any surprises from the beginning. Uh, that includes, you know, we've got a long-running history of um, blogs from our teachers and our campuses to tell information that's going on at school. As a matter of fact, in our kindergarten through fifth grade, uh, signing up for a blog is a station in the registration process. You will not get out of the building in, until you're registered for your teachers for the blog of the teachers that have your student to keep that going on. So they see the technology being used in that way, and that gives them some comfort about what's happening. Now, have we had issues? Yes, we have. Uh, have we had students that got somewhere that they weren't supposed to get? Yes, we have. And we dealt with that the same way we would in any other case. But one of the things that we've been able to point out and working through the school board and through campus principals and all of our parents is, to my knowledge, every issue that we've had of someone going to an inappropriate site, which I can count those on one hand in the last seven or eight years, has been an issue where they brought that site to school. They knew what they were looking for before they came to us and they tried to find a way to get around our filters to get to it. So then, you know, really the conversation comes back to the, the methods that you use to prevent those things. And the main method that we use and the one that we tout as being most successful in White Oak is a, is a professional educator that's actively involved in monitoring the activities of students. That's our filter. That's how we make sure our kids are safe on the Internet. And really, whether you've got the best filters and you've got cranked down as tight as you can or no filters at all, that's truly the only thing that you can that you can count on in that process. All right, excellent. So final words, what piece of advice would you give a district that is where they are and they want to be where you are? How do they get started? Well, let me tell you from our, from our department of technology, what helped us was that we decided we weren't going to be a server farm. Uh, forward thinking by Michael Grass, we no longer house servers here. Now, all of our data is out in the cloud, so all we do is provide bandwidth, which that allows us to provide those devices in the classroom because we reallocated that money. We put it in the hands of the learner instead of trying to control the process of their learning. They're in charge of it and now they can access their data anywhere at any time and we utilize sources out there that that have strong security backups and the kids don't lose their data, the staff don't lose their data. They know that they can access it from anywhere and they're very comfortable with that and, and that's been a big benefit because like Mr. Gilbert said, we try to make ourselves as transparent as possible so our students have those same blogs and they embed their, their products in there. So I would say quit thinking, I've got to protect my department, um, I've got to be the, the big filter you know, guardian for all the kids because our teachers do such a good job with that. We hire, my favorite line of Mr. Gilbert is we hire professionals, yeah. plain and simple. Absolutely. And from the curriculum side, Cheryl, probably the, 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 the greatest piece here too for that side is that the focus is about transforming the classroom. We've provided our teachers with a number of tools and resources and strategies that are built into those pieces that will help them do that. Much of that technology integration is a, a huge part of that, but also to the resources that they are able to, to bring that curriculum to life, to facilitate that learning, and for it to be for today's learner. That's great. I think I would probably finish that up by, you know, making a couple of statements. Number one, um, don't put a timeline on this. That's probably the most important thing that you can understand about this process. Seven years ago, we created a vision here that we were going to have to, we were going to have technology in the classroom. We were going to put things in the hands of our teachers that would affect the learning of our students. And we were going to create an atmosphere where our kids were 21st century learners. In that process, I was prepared and the people that were in the conversation with me were prepared to allow that to take as long as it had to take. Uh, we were not going to require the use of technology. We were not going to mandate that so many things were done before midterm or whatever. 
And quite frankly, if, if we were here seven years later and we have 10 teachers that were using technology and 90 that weren't, we're going to go about the process of celebrating the, the successes of the 10. And that would probably be the second part of what I would say in this process. As an administrative staff, from the superintendent on down, you've got to be willing and prepared to celebrate victories. You know, and those may be small or big. But in our case, when we, we've taught um, most of our teachers the process of uh, project-based learning and inquiry-driven instruction, and when our kids have a project and they're about to do a presentation in sixth grade in the library, you can bet the superintendent of schools and assistant superintendent and the mayor of White Oak and the fire chief and whoever is going to be in that room with them, and we're going to be excited about what they're doing. That helps, the, you know, that's validity to the students, and that's confirmation to the teachers that what they're doing is important, and that's how we, you know, that's how the process grows because there's buy-in. That's super. Well, I can't tell you how much I appreciate your time and energy. I think what you've shared is of real value, and I think you've given us some clear steps on uh, how we can move towards the kind of success that you've had. I want to celebrate White Oak's success, so congratulations on everything that you've done, and thank you for meeting with me today. Bye, thank everyone. You. Thank you, Cheryl. Take care.